The TCM Classic Film Festival assembles a call sheet for the ages. Opening night debuts with E.T. the Extraterrestrial with director Steven Spielberg in attendance. Legendary actors take the stage with tributes honoring Piper Laurie and Bruce Dern. From the complete uncut version of Babyface to the Stone Cold Coffee with an appearance by Pam Greer. This ensemble can only be seen at the TCM Classic Film Festival. April 21st through the 24th in Hollywood. Stiffish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. devoted to honoring and deconstructing classic cinema. As always, I'm Kristen. It's been three years since we last went to the TCM Classic Film Festival in person, but back we went to the wilds of Hollywood Boulevard. We have some amazing audio for you, and we're going to kick off this hour of TCM with our exclusive red carpet interviews with host Jacqueline Stewart and performer Dana Gould. Can you talk a little bit about the emotions of coming back to doing this festival in person? It's kind of overwhelming, actually. Yeah. I mean, I was a guest at a couple of festivals before the lockdown that's right, happened. Yeah. So this is actually my first time as a TCM host at the festival. Oh my gosh, that's right! It's incredible just to see how happy people are to be together again and to watch these films projected on film with a group of film lovers, there's nothing like it. Well, you're doing several intros during this fest. You are working hard. <laughs> Do you have one you're excited or nervous? Or... I am just beside myself that I'm gonna talk to Pam Greer, who yes. is an wow. icon and a personal hero of mine. I had a coffee poster hanging in my faculty office for years. And then I'm also doing a Cooley High reunion yeah. panel discussion, and that's a film that means so much to people, especially people from Chicago, like myself, so both of those I'm thrilled about. And you're doing the Floyd Norman talk. Yes, yes the Floyd Norman tribute. I mean, as a Disney nerd, I've got my seat saved already. Yes. So. I want to be sure we leave enough time for people to ask him questions, because... It would just be me asking him, does he know he's Floyd Norman, <laughs> and that he's awesome. I'd say, yes I do. <laughs> the last question I wanted to ask, I got through the pandemic thanks to TCM mm. is there a movie so that got you through the pandemic a classic film that wow that's such a great question the standby for me is it's a wonderful life yeah it's a film that I watch every Christmas Eve or when I just feel like I need something heartwarming comfort, yeah comfort movie for sure uh, Jacqueline thank you so much I'm so glad we got finally got to yes. talk I'm asking everybody this is the first festival in two years what is it for you to be back on this carpet and be talking about classic films in this way, in person? Well, you know, most people watch movies at home alone, and the greatest thing about the festival is the community sense you get. Watching a movie with people that you know, it's the difference between watching a baseball game and being at the park. I'd much rather be at the park. You're doing the live read, which I know you did one at the virtual fest last time with Plan 9. Can you talk a little bit about putting that together and why this film? Well, yeah, we wanted to find another film that was as funny as Plan 9 in the way that we do them. And it was actually much harder than I thought. Oh, really? Yeah, you can get a bad film and that's great, but what you need is a bad film that thinks it's doing great. And Plan 9 is the king. I Married a Monster from Outer Space who came a close second. I was very surprised when I watched it. I was like, because I'd seen a lot of movies and I was getting discouraged. And then I saw that and I was like, I lit up. The weird thing is we're getting married in August and my computer right now is all plans for the wedding and I Married a Monster, I Married a Monster, I Married a Monster. That's quite the double, the double <laughs> feature right there. TCM got me through the pandemic. Is there a classic film that got you through the pandemic? Oh, there, we, we went through phases. We went through phases. I mean, well, yeah. Can you share one of the phases? He saw Lord of the Rings for the first time. Seriously? Entire, yeah, I watched the entire series the first time. You have time for it during a pandemic. You have time for so. it. In terms of old movies, I went on a big noir binge. Always and, good. Uh, detour. I think oh, that's a good favorite. one. That's a good one. Thank you, so Thank you so much. One of the highlights from this year's fest was watching the 1955 Joan Crawford feature Queen Bee. If you haven't seen Queen Bee, you're missing out on one of Joan's best from that decade. Author William Joyce set the bar for what was to come with his introduction. So let's give that a listen. 
is so awesome to be here again after waiting two years for this festival to make its way through COVID. So congratulations to us all to getting to watch the movies the way we should again. Yes, oh my gosh, they're like the Vatican of the movies. I mean, I feel like I'm on holy ground every time I come in. I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage. I had prepared a slideshow that would sort of explain the evolution of John Crawford's eyebrows. Oh. And something went wrong. I somehow think it must be the power of Joan that, that destroyed that slideshow. So I'm going to have to just wing it a little bit. So please forgive me. Joan Crawford. It may seem that stardom came to her easily. She was a Broadway veteran by her teens. She signed to MGM in 1925 to become a movie star. At first, they didn't have that much confidence in her, but she changed their minds. <laughs> now, 1925, she could have been 21 years old or 24 years old. We don't know. Her date of birth is listed, and it's I'm not kidding. It says... 1904 through 1908. <laughs> she seemed to be in a hurry when most other things were involved, but that, I don't know what she was fudging on. I suppose that you she didn't want to tell everybody how old she was. So she was in her mid 20s or early 20s by the time she went to MGM and began her climb to stardom. And she didn't like her first roles at MGM. She thought she was getting too many second string roles. And then this this amazing guy, Pete Smith, at MGM, who did the Pete Smith specialties, said, there's something about this girl that Louie Mayer and nobody else at the studio has really seen. And he goes, we got to find her a different name. Her name at that point was Louise LeSueur. And Louie Mayer said, it sounded too much like Sewer. And they, so they had a contest to rename her, and fans would write in. The winning name was Joan Arden. Do you think we'd be standing here? Would it be the same if it was Joan Arden? Somehow Crawford seemed to encapsulate her better. And that had been Pete Smith's suggestion. Joan Crawford hated the name. She said it sounded like a crawfish. <laughs> but it worked. She began a series of flapper epics in the 1920s. And this is when we get the first glimpse of her almost maniacal and desperate radiance of personality. She's in these films dancing the Charleston with a ferocity that's almost bestial. <laughs> terrifying. There's a reason none of the guys get up and try to dance with her. She's kind of terrifying up there. <laughs> but she impressed people. She impressed audiences and the intelligentsia even. She became, in the 30s, a sort of pinnacle, a high priestess of glamour and a certain chiseled beauty. I asked Scott Fitzgerald wrote about her beautifully, as he always did. Joan Crawford, he said, is doubtless the best example of a flapper, of the flapper girl you see in smart nightclubs, gowned to the apex of, of sophistication, toying with iced glasses of booze with a remote, faintly bitter expression, dancing deliciously, laughing a great deal with those wide eyes. She was a young thing that was desperate, and desperate with a talent for living. Man, that guy could figure stuff out. Good old Scotty. But by the end of the 30s, she had done so many of these films that people were tiring of them, and she was labeled box office poison in 1938. But she would not be denied. She would stay a star. She reinvented herself and resurrected in 1945 with like a phoenix Mildred Pierce. Which is, what she does in Mildred Pierce is singular and amazing. She seemed to be able to rein in her excesses and become vulnerable. And when she does that in films, which she doesn't often, she's really touching. All that armor plate that she wore of glamour faded away a little bit. It made you feel even more for her than, than otherwise. From Mildred Pierce on, she began to evolve into the presence on the screen the likes of which we have never seen before or since. Her desperate talent for living that Fitzgerald wrote about became a desperate, unquenchable need to stay a movie star. Beginning with films like 1949's Flamingo Road, she metamorphosed 
or metamorphosed, or whatever, <laughs> into this increasingly wild-eyed, kabuki-faced being <laughs> that radiated so much power and anger and sexuality. And she was no longer like someone in the same movie with her fellow actors. She totally dominated every scene she was in. They were incidental to the film, but they were not incidental to Joan Crawford. She was actually, it's, I'm told, very kind to her fellow uh, actors off screen. But she wanted to be the biggest star there was. Her movements, her makeup, her costumes, her every gesture became a series of wildly exaggerated moments that wiped everyone else off the screen. So the only person I can compare her to is Elvis. He had the eyebrows too. And well, you know, you watch an Elvis movie, and Elvis is in a different movie than everybody else. He's in an Elvis movie. Everybody else is like, they look like they watered in from Leave it to Beaver. And they're, and they're acting like that. It's like they're in picket fence land, and Elvis is he's ready to rock the world. The movie may be in black and white, but he's in color, right? She's the same way. Her sudden glares and raising of those increasingly thick eyebrows <laughs> were like bull whips or chainsaws against the other actors. The movies may have been made in Hollywood, but she ruled Planet Joan, absolutely. And in her movies, she is the star, especially in this period. In Queen Bee, we could all sit down and argue which one is the most defiantly over the top Joan Crawford movie, but Queen Bee has everything it needs for that. She has the eyebrows, they become gigantic and weird. Her hair has become strange. There's a number of scenes in this movie where her hair and the lamp are the same shape. I want you to keep an eye out for that. She wears a dress in this that's such like Martian high priestess coming down the stairs. It's so thick and starched. You can hear it as it hits the stairs behind her, as she descends to devour everyone in the movie. So here we are to celebrate and watch Joan Crawford at her most Joan Crawfordy. It's something that the movies give us that nothing else can. This amazing personality, this expression of will that doesn't happen very often. And so there she is, Joan Crawford, in all her magnificent strangeness. I think that this is the pinnacle of her remarkable career. She let herself be really vulnerable, I think, one more time, and that was in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Yeah. And it's very moving, I think, because yeah. she seems, for the first time, genuinely frail. And I think that she had a hard life, and I think she fought as hard as she could for the entirety of that long life. So it's nice to stand here and get to see her strut her stuff. So enjoy yourselves, enjoy the eyebrows, and thank you for coming. Before we get into the next bit of audio, we'd like to remind you that if you enjoy Ticklish Business, please consider supporting us via our Patreon. We give away pins, DVDs, Blu-rays, and books throughout the year. Plus, patrons are able to guest on upcoming episodes. If you become a patron now, you'll get access to our six-week summer series, Being Elvis, looking at biopics starring the king of rock and roll. It kicks off May 27th. Now, back to the episode. You might remember actress Aileen Quinn from her role as Annie in the movie of the same name. We were able to chat with her about playing the character, as well as working with titans like John Huston and Carol Burnett. We also talked to the legend herself, Pam Greer, right after TCM announced plans to devote the next season of The Plot Thickens to the actors. So let's hear it from them. I'm asking everybody about being back on this carpet after a two-year absence. Can you talk about being back on a film festival red carpet, especially celebrating Annie? Oh, yes. It feels wonderful, number one, that it's the, I hate saying this number out loud, but the 40th anniversary, but I feel 10 years younger than I am. So that's an honor. It just feels so good to be out again. I mean, my band's working again. I'm out performing and singing. So it just feels good to be with people again and to connect. Because obviously, as performers, it is what you're writing or singing or doing, but it's also the connection and meeting people. And we can finally do that again and see them. I got a nerd out about Annie. For a classic film person, John Houston and Ryan King. Right. Carol, I mean, Albert. Everybody is yes. there. Yes. Tim Curry. <laughs> 
How about Tim yes. Gaddy? How could you Tim forget Cruz? Rooster? I know. Looking back, what is it like to look back on that and realize the Titans that you're working on? I mean, I would just be constantly like intimidated and crying. Yeah. Luckily, I was 10 years old and I only knew <laughs> Carol Burnett from a commercial on TV. Oh my God. Not from the Carol okay. Burnett show. And she goes, You're right, that is the commercial. And obviously, you listen to it because you're reading scripts. It was for Reading is Fundamental. Okay. That's what I thought she was from. The Reading is Fundamental lady. <laughs> so that really says it all. Oh and John Houston, he was like my grandfather that just happened to have these great visions. And I thought, I could tell he was so bright. Yeah. But I just thought he was like a grandfather. So I had no idea who these people were. I'm assuming that Anne Ryan King just broke out into dance all the time. Gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. dancer. And she had to wait around so much on sets. I'm sure that was so different from her from theater. Waiting, you know, hurry up and wait. And she still stayed limber. She was gorgeous in that. We've got Annie Seekins. Yeah. And let's go to the movies. Yeah. It was so fun doing that with her. But those legs, those yeah. long legs. They're insane. They're yes. like TCM yeah. got me through the pandemic. Is there yeah. a classic film that got you through the pandemic? Oh my gosh. Digging into film noir. Okay. Because I hung out in Palm Springs and I believe Thursday nights are film noir. Okay. And there were like three or five. I cannot remember their names because I didn't have the DVRs. So I was watching them. But I got really into film noir and I'm going to try to see some of the festival. Okay. It is so great to get to talk to you. We follow each other on Twitter, I think. Yes, we do, by the way. <laughs> what is it like to be walking this red carpet? been celebrating classic movies again. I herald everyone. <laughs> I am so excited for us being responsible because we're all, uh, you know, walking sacks of biology. Yeah. I have been around for so long knowing that I've been to other countries where they have the black plague. You know, cholera yeah. can break out and just wipe well, out an entire country. Then, yeah. But we're smarter. And there's things that you have to take above religion and politics is your biology. Okay, I'm a cancer survivor three times. Okay, and I miss it. And that's the reason why I'm here. Okay, and being a pre-med student, I have so many animals to take care of. You know, my horses, my dogs, everything. So I know what works, what keeps us in life. That's why you're a badass. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's why you're a badass. You call me a badass, girl? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on now. I love you. That's why I said my horses would love you. Well, I was fortunate to meet Robert Forrester before he passed. You did. Oh, don't. Oh, I'm a cry. He was you know the, that. I'm telling you, I'm a cry. Do you, we talk about you and, and him and Jackie Brown as like the greatest love story of all time. It was. You know what? I, I was going to rewrite the ending for Quentin. I said, okay, what if now... I drive off and I come around and open the door and he changes his mind and tosses his clothes off and, turns <laughs> off and jumps in the car and we take off and he starts chattering. Chatter, 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 chatter. He can't stop talking. Okay, I'm not going to be able to do this. It was a wrong move. I'm going to drive around the block and I'm going to let you out. And I kick him out of the car and take off. <laughs> That was my take. On yeah, Jackie Brown, like that is still social media. Not a day goes by that we're not talking about like the power of you and him and that relationship and that movie. He was wonderful. It? Yeah, he was really wonderful, and I just loved his energy. Yeah, you know, the with the restraining of our our affection yeah. towards each other was really amazing. exactly. And to see relationship over, you know, it's always young, beautiful people. So I think that well, we just didn't jump on each yeah. other and push each other against the it's wall and knock all the furniture yeah. down. You it's, know, like they do in all the movies. Yeah. My legs are wrapped around him, and we're bouncing against the wall. And this year's opening night film was a huge deal and showed E.T. was not playing around with bringing the festival back. E.T. the Extraterrestrial with Steven Spielberg in attendance. This was the first year I was invited to actually attend the opening night film, so I was excited to say the least. But it's only appropriate to end things with Steven Spielberg's fabulous introduction to his film, as well as a long-ranging discussion about his career with TCM host Ben Mankiewicz. So let's give the floor to Steven Spielberg and Ben. Uh, welcome. Thank you, guys. Uh, good evening. I am indeed the one and only Ben Mankiewicz. Uh, uh, welcome to the uh, uh, 2022 TCM Classic Film Festival. Uh, you know, what's, uh, what's been going on with you guys over the last couple of years? <laughs> Um, I uh, have been very, very active over the last two plus years. Uh, hardly a day went by that I didn't take like four or five photos of my dog, Bob Mankiewicz. <laughs> I uh, uh, binge-watched binge the, the entire Get Smart series uh, three times, by the way. <laughs> Still have a huge crush on Barbara Feldman. Um, and I've become the uh, finest uh, uh, wordle player in North America. Uh, 
let me tell you, man, Tamar's life has been rich and full. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, my God, I have missed you guys. <laughs> Most of you, actually. Um, I think we could all do with a little bit less Mario Canto. Am I right? <laughs> He had to say something. Um, we did 10 festivals from 2010 through 2019, and I think it's fair to say that tonight all of us at TCM are feeling the same anxious excitement that we felt at the very first festival in 2010. Uh, these last few years have been hard for all of us, of course, some uh, more than others. But I think no matter how the pandemic affected our lives, we were all comforted in ways big and small by, by the movies we love. Uh, over the course of the last two years, I've been asked by so many people, uh, whether it's uh, TCM fans like you or the TCM social media team, the, the question of what, what movies uh, helped me through the pandemic. And you know, I always want to give a, a, a thoughtful and appropriate answer. And so I, Initially, I would say like, pictures like, you know, Random Harvest, or, or I Remember Mama, or the best years of our lives. They're all emotional stories about people coming together, right? People coming back together. But you know, what I learned, and what I suspect you guys did too, was, was that the movie didn't need to meet the moment. The moment created a need for the movies. So what helped me over the last two years, uh, you know, has a glory. Helped me over the last two years. Uh, sweet smell of success. Uh, 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 Pam Greer and Jackie Brown helped me. And sure, uh, I'll be honest, the random artist helped me too. I mean, like, oh, Smithy! Paula! You're not crying then. You're not who? So I know that tonight I'm largely preaching to the choir. What I'm about to say is not news to you. TCM is not a, a TV channel. TCM is a way of life. <laughs> Those of us lucky enough to be in this room are part of a community of movie lovers, a community that does not uh, think like other people. Right? Uh, ask a normal person uh, about, say, 1934, uh, and they'll say, mm, Middle of the Depression. Ask us, and we say, ah, the end of the pre code here. <laughs> Someone scolds us for consistently seeing the world in black and white, and we're like, thank you, it does add texture to the storytelling. <laughs> and finally, tonight, our little movie community is back together, back where we really belong. Over the next, yes, yes, yes. Over the next uh, four days and nights, I expect to have dozens of great conversations and take hundreds of, of pictures. Not, not with you people, though mostly be selfies. <laughs> Here's a little slice of, uh, of what we have in store, an amazing selection of, of actors, uh, movies, directors, producers, artists, film critics, and historians, many of them in conversation with TCM's great lineup of hosts, and also with Eddie. <laughs> I thought there'd be more booing. Uh, we will be paying tribute to many special guests, including Bruce Dern, Floyd yeah. Norman, Piper yeah. Lori, yeah. Lily Tomlin. will be enshrined in this theater's legendary courtyard tomorrow. Plus, Leonard Baldwin will become the third recipient of the Robert Osborne Award. <laughs> 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 of Alicia, Dave, Jacqueline, and Eddie. <laughs> Thank you for coming out to Hollywood for the 11th and also the 13th to see Classic Film Festival. Tonight, our opening night film that was a classic, The Moment, it was released in 1982. 
E.T. the Extraterrestrial quickly became the highest grossing movie of all time, topping Star Wars, and it is as good a family film as has ever been made. And we are fortunate tonight to have so many of the people who contributed to the making of this film in the audience with us. So please rise and, and be acknowledged. Uh, we'll begin with actress Dee Wallace. <laughs> Sean Fry and KC Martell are here. <laughs> the Stunt ET, Matthew Demerit, is here. Jim's <laughs> production designer, Jim Bissell. Jim? Ben Burt is here. <laughs> and his other great friend, Matt Photo Assistant Craig Barron. Craig, thank you for you. Drew Barrymore and Henry Thomas were scheduled to be with us. They said yes right away. They were eager to be here, but then life and the movies and the pandemic and everything that can happen happened, so they are not here but they wanted badly to be here, and we thank them for initially accepting. <laughs> now, this, uh, this great film that we're gonna see tonight uh, sprang from the mind of our guest. Uh, he's a film director and a great TCM fan. You may have seen uh, some of his movies. <laughs> he's a huge supporter of ours. We're so grateful that he's here. Please welcome the director of E.T., yes. Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Right. She brought huge, huge ice chests 
for Mountain Dew and Pepsi every single day. She gave it to the crew and she said, if you don't belch after drinking, it's an insult. <laughs> so she was, she, she was uh, having a good time. You, uh, uh, I think I read, uh, maybe I heard, but did, did you, you said that, that you were grateful to her uh, because she treated you as if you knew what you were doing when you, when you probably didn't. I did not know what I was doing uh, half the time because it was intimidating. I had never worked with a crew that size before. I've been making 16 millimeter movies with friends in college and I had made an unfinished 35 millimeter film about a bicycle race and then I had done Amblin in 35 which got me my contract at Universal. But that was a crew of 15 people and I was surrounded by um, mostly men mostly men in 1968 in, um, in blazers with hats and ties. Um, the gaffers, the, the electricians, the, 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 the grips, they wore ties. The grips wore ties? ties? Yes. It was, it, was, it was a change of the guard. It was, a, it, was a, it was the evolution from Henry King and King Theodore to Martin Scorsese and Brian De Palma. That's what it's happening. <laughs> um, so uh, when you were growing up and you started to fall in love with the movies, what, what movies sort of uh, uh, framed your outlook uh, on life? What did you go to again and again? Well, what was available to me uh, when I was very, very young, my parents were really uh, truant officers about what I was allowed to see in a movie theater. They were really careful about that. And I was living in New Jersey in Haddonfield when the Searchers opened, and a couple of my friends had seen the Searchers. And that was in, I was 10 years old, and uh, they were saying it was great. And my parents said, "No, we heard about it, and we heard it's, it, it's not right for you. You're too young to see it." And I remember going into the cookie jar and getting 50 cents out of the cookie jar and dimes, and walking a mile and a half to the theater and paying and got my ticket, and I saw the Searchers. I never told my parents I had done that. <laughs> you turned out okay. Um, so when you were doing the, the Jaws, which was a film about a shark, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, you met Henry Hathaway, who directed the True Grit and Niagara and, and Nevada Smith, and, and, and he said to you, and, I, and I'm curious, it seems like this really stuck with you, never let them see your fear your indecisiveness. Right. He just said, let me give you a piece of advice before you go off to shoot your fish movie. He called it the fish movie. <laughs> he, he just said, it. I know it's a, it's a, you know, there's a book out, and I know it's a big, the fish, fish book, and you're making the fish movie, but just remember one thing. He said, if you have any doubts about a shot or about a, 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 something you want to tell the crew, and you don't quite know what to say, figure really fast what to say and say anything because you cannot, the second you show weakness, they're going to swamp you. And I remember that, him saying that, you're just gonna swamp you. And that sense, that feeling that, that uh, of some degree of panic, that, that, that's fueled you. You've used that to, to help you along during these productions. I did, and it turned out that I, I showed a lot of insecurity, I showed a lot of doubt. And it was the ocean and the mechanical shark that swamped me, not anybody in the crew. They were great with me. Uh, they were great with me because I held the keys to their going home. I was the warden of Jaws. And when I finished the movie, they, get to, they got to go home. And we had a 58-day schedule. And when we got to 72 days, they started being really nice to me. How can we help you? What more can we do to speed you along in finishing this? Because we were out of the water. We weren't like in a tank or in a lake. We were 12 miles past the Cape Hope Lighthouse, past Menemsha on Martha's Vineyard. And we're, we're at sea making this movie. And, um, and it was nothing like it has ever happened to me since. So your uh, sister has described you as a lonely kid. And I'm curious how that experience, uh, some bullying, uh, ultimately your, your parents divorcing when you were, what, 15, which is pretty close to the same age that yeah, I, was, I was 17. Except that's exactly how old I was when my parents split up. And uh, uh, it's not easy that you think, oh, he's here, he's fine. But your, your opinions of your parents has been so fully formed by them that it's kind of shocking to realize how fallible they are. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So how did all that, how did that experience, and this is a very broad question, but how did that experience then as we move forward in, inform you as you set about the process of, of ET? 
Well, I think when you go through something like that, and when any child goes through, um, a, a, you know, an episode where your parents, who you trust and love unconditionally, but both of them come to you and my three younger sisters and just say, we are separating and we're going to be living not only in two different houses, but in two different states. Um, it's the world collapses, the sky falls on your head. And it just, I'm, I'm sure those here that, that, that are children of, of, of a divorced household or, or themselves have been divorced, and they know the responsibility of how you have to super take care of your kids. It's something that never goes away, and it comes out in the wash, and certainly has come out in a lot of my movies, and it, both indirectly and subconsciously, and in the latest film that I've just made, uh, it comes out very directly. It, it's, I mean, E.T. is pretty direct. I mean, there's, a, there's literally an absentee father throughout the film. Um, so the, the concept for E.T., and you clearly you'll correct me where I'm wrong, I mean, really, it's the two different ideas and some pressure to make a sequel with Close Encounters all coming together. Well, what happened was I had been working on an actual literal script about my parents' separation and divorce. And I had been working on ideas about that and what it did to my sisters and myself. And this is back in 1976 when I was, I was actually filming Close Encounters. And we got to the scene, we were shooting in Mobile, Alabama, and we got to the scene where the pup, we call the little extraterrestrial pup, where he comes down from the ship and he does the hand signs with Francois Truffaut, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and he the of my life and he said yes to that. And, uh, and we shoot this scene, and I suddenly, and then I suddenly thought, wait a second, what if that little creature never went back to the ship? What if the creature, creature was part of a foreign exchange program? <laughs> Dreyfus goes, he stays, or she stays. Um, and, and, um, and that was the feeling that I had. What if I turned my story about divorce into a story about uh, children, a family trying to fill the great need and, and, and creating such responsibility. A divorce creates great responsibility, especially if you, you have siblings. We all take care of each other. And what if Elliot, or the kid I was, hadn't quite dreamed up his name yet, needed to, for the first time in his life, become responsible for a, a life form to fill the gap in his heart? So, but before we got to E.T., so you're, this idea is germinating, and then you have become, you've gone from this successful, making these good made-for-TV movies, Duel in particular, and then you start making features, you sure do right now. Duel story. Woo! Um, yeah, story. Yeah, the quick Duel story, because it shows, I don't know, it runs counter to one of the narratives about the, all those the early great the, the filmmakers from, from your era, you know, the, the Scorsese and, and, and Coppola and, and, and then Peter Bogdanovich with Freak and I think it was all these great filmmakers. That you know, you were uh, 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 they were more renegade, and you were uh, more of a studio guy, giving the studios what they want. But in Duel, and you're like what, 24 years old when you make Duel, something like that? Uh, yeah, I think 24. Yeah. yeah. So you do the movie, and at the end of the movie, it's a movie about Dennis Weaver versus a truck, and the truck goes over a cliff. You got a lot of really cool shots about what happens to the truck, and the network says this is great, but this is uh, America and you're gonna to need to blow up the truck. <laughs> uh, uh, and what do you say? Um, well, I didn't have any, I had, I had no power except the power to say action, cut, print, and set up the camera. That was it. When it came to releasing on a major American network, they had a lot of clout, and I, I was helpless and felt hopeless when the director got back to me through my producer, George Eckstein, that they were ordering me to go back out there at their expense, they paid for it, and blow up the truck. Because you can't have a movie that ends with a truck have slot dying a very slow, painful death. <laughs> with the oil dripping down the steering wheel and the, 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 the tire slowing down and the fan going, and, and they hated that. They wanted a pyrotechnic ending. And George Eckstein came to me and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't want to shoot it, but what can I do? And George said, well, I'm the producer, let me go to work on ABC. And George delivered the good news the next day that they weren't going to make me reshoot the end. He fought the fight, which is what's great about having a producer that has your back. Everybody has to know how important producers are in our, in our lives and our worlds, especially when we're just starting out. They are essential.
We, uh, well, let's say we finish Jaws and Close Encounters, because now, obviously, we're fused. Um, so, <laughs> you finish Jaws and Close Encounters. This is, uh, you can't, you can't be more successful than, uh, as a film director, than you were right then. And, and what do you make next? Um, I, 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 well, I, I sort of uh, make the explosion from Duel that never got made for Duel. I made it instead for 1941, which was the next film. <laughs> that, was the, um, that, that was that was uh, the biggest detonation at that moment of my career. <laughs> you, uh, so, what was uh, that moment like? What is that? You, you, you're on top of the world, and you experience very quickly how, how fast it can change in Hollywood. All of a sudden. Uh, it's not well received critically, it doesn't do the business that you expected, and, and all of a sudden you've made essentially a flop. Not quite a flop, but, but what's that like? It, it, it was a flop for at least 20 years. <laughs> and then Universal said, well, we broke even in Japan, so that's something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, well, I, I enjoyed making the film. It was my longest schedule. Jaws was a very long schedule. It was, it was, Scheduled for 58 days, we shot 158 days. One 100 days over schedule. Um, but because of the two hits back to back, the studios just start writing checks. You know that's what happens. And they 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 gave me a unlimited ceiling to make 1941. And I, it took me 178 days to shoot the picture because I directed all the miniature work. That was first unit, not second unit photography. And that was a big mistake that I never should have made. But I had a great time making the film. And then when I showed the picture for the first time in Texas, at my Good Luck Theater, where I showed Jaws, the Medallion Theater in Dallas, Texas, huge audience reaction to Jaws. Then I took Close Encounters there. It's my Good Luck Theater. Great reaction to Close Encounters. And then I took 1941 there, and you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was the first comedy ever made without laughs. <laughs> I'm, I'm always fascinated by the successful people who respond to failure, right? And public failure, right? So, uh, and you responded effectively with a film called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and uh, that leads us then to uh, JET. And so these different ideas come together and you sort of combine that little close encounters idea. Resisting pressure, by the way, once again, resisting studio and money pressure to make close encounters too said no, um, uh, and you come up with this picture and, and this idea, your idea, E.T., uh, how the script get made, I, I love this. Well, you know, I, I pretty much had worked out most of the story, um, and I, I, I needed a writer to write it with me, or hopefully write it, with just, just based on the story, and I was shooting uh, in Tunisia, uh, we were shooting um, uh, Outside the Well of the Souls with Harrison, and Harrison's girlfriend, Melissa Matheson, was there on location. And she had done Black Stallion. She'd written Black Stallion, which I adored. She co-wrote that, which I adored that film. And um, and I was just talking to her, and I told her my E.T. idea, the whole sort of story. And she said, well, I'm retired from writing. I don't write anymore. I'm, I'm not interested in writing anymore. It's too hard. And so and she turned me down. And I went to Harrison, and I said, your girlfriend turned me down. <laughs> she doesn't want to write my next movie or, or movie in the future. And he said, well, let me talk to her. And he talked to her and she came to me the next day. She said, okay, well, you got Harrison so excited about this. What is it that I missed? And I think I hadn't told the story to her very well because I told her the story again. And she got really emotional hearing the story again. She committed right in the middle of the, the Tunisian desert. Um, I've not heard of a process like the one you had with Melissa Matheson for, for, for writing the script. Uh, uh, describe that. Now, how did you guys get five days on and then five days together? Well, what we did was I, I was editing with Mike Hahn. Um, I was editing Raiders at our editing room with the Marine Del Rey. And she would come to the editing room and she would wait until Mike, I gave Mike my input and then go to another room or take a walk. She'd come over and we'd spend two hours a day for five days, and then she'd go off and write pages. And then she'd come back with those pages and we'd do another five days. Because the, I, I had given her the narrative, but all the little moments like E.T.'s ability to, um, you know, to teleport things, E.T.'s ability, you know, with telekinesis, 
and all of those things, and also the idea that E.T. could feel your feelings, he could feel Elliot's feelings. That was something that happened in the spontaneity of working with the writer. It was never in the story I presented to Melissa. There were so many details of character that Melissa just brought into my world from her world. And at the end of this process of her going away and writing and then coming in and talking to you and then her going away and writing, she turns in a, a first draft she, screenplay. She turns in a, a first draft screenplay and I was, was editing in, in a, at uh, my cutting room. I actually was having lunch with Kathy Kennedy who was my associate producer on Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then um, I asked her, Would you want to you want to raise? Want to be a producer? I was like, be a producer. Will you produce E.T.? Did she get a mail? Yeah, she no, she, she didn't turn me down. No, she was uh, <laughs> She said yes. And so I uh, went over to her and I just said, I think I've read the greatest first draft of my life. You have to read this. And she read it overnight, called me the next day and said, I haven't read a lot of scripts. This is the best script I've ever read. And that's all because of Melissa. And that's pretty much the script you guys shot. Right? We shot the script. Um, so, yeah, now, uh, why would you shoot E.T. Uh, in continuity? You hadn't done that in a movie before, right? I had, I had um, other than maybe TV. Yeah, I, no, I had never really shot anything in continuity. Well, Sugarland, my first film, I shot in continuity. But I especially shot E.T. in continuity because of the, of the ages, of the characters, of Henry Thomas and Robert McNaughton and Drew Barrymore. Drew was like six at the time. And I wanted the actors, the kids, and Dee Wallace, who, the reason I cast Dee, she has the heart of a child. And she would allow her kids to call her Mary, not mom. Because we called my mom, I call, I call, we all call my mom Lee. Her name is Leo. We didn't call her mom, we called her Lee. And so, uh, so in a sense, I cast the child in Dee Wallace to be part of, the, so she wasn't really the adult. Peter Coyote was the adult, but Dee was part of the kid group. And, um, and I wanted the kids to know that what we were shooting now, today, is happening today. And the next three pages of the script will happen tomorrow. And what we just shot happened yesterday. And I wanted them to actually live a life. To live a life of the story, which they did. So at the end of the movie, when they were, I don't want to give it away, if nobody <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's kind of a, there's a lot of emotion at the end of the story and all that. Well, they were there for every take because they were bidding for well. They were saying goodbye for real because they knew soon they'd be going home. So uh, let's talk about that casting. You mentioned uh, <coughs> casting D. Uh, uh, why little Drew Barrymore for Gertie? I, I looked at a lot of young young kids for Gertie and for also for Elliot and for Michael. But when Drew came into my office, she took over the meeting by storm. <laughs> she stormed the citadel of my office at MGM. <laughs> she really did. And she said, I said, do you like acting? She said, I'm not an actor. I have a punk rock band. <laughs> and she started telling me about this punk rock band that she had already formed, and she was going to play concerts with this punk. I believed her. <laughs> she had such an inner life. And I realized after a while that she didn't really have a punk rock band. But if she could believe she did, then she believed this little mechanical creature was a real extraterrestrial, and she was in my movie that day. <laughs> uh, 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 Jack Fisk, who was uh, Sissy Spacek's husband. He, he found it and then for me, yes. In a movie called The Brandy Man. Yes. So, uh, people can watch Henry's audition. It's on, it's on YouTube. Uh, take us through that. What was that experience? Well, um, Mike Fenton and Mike Fenton and Jane Feinberg cast the movie with me, and and uh, so Mike was reading the sides with all the actors that came in. And uh, when I met Henry at the at the at the um, suggestion of Jack Fisk, and he, she sent me a reel of a, just a couple of small scenes Henry was in in, in Raggedy Man. And so I, I watched that, and I was impressed, but I but he was very introverted. And so I wanted him to come in, but I, he was having trouble with the dialogue. But he read the lines; it was a little bit, it was a little bit uncomfortable. He wasn't really natural with the lines. So I asked him if they do an improv, and I set up a situation where he had a best friend who was a creature. Didn't say it was an alien. I just said, "You have a best friend. He's really little and he's helpless and he needs help. And these big bad guys from the government want to take him away." And Mike played the big bad guy from the government. <laughs> 
and I just rolled the video camera, and the rest is on YouTube right now. If you want to watch it, it is a. It's, I mean, as a, as a, as a, I don't even know if you have to be a parent if you care at all about children. You, I mean, it's hard to watch in a sense. It's brilliant, but he is. I mean, he is really good. It's so he's powerful. so good, and he's he's suffering the the situation that I put him in because it wasn't a situation to him. It was he was defending this imaginary creature with his life. And uh, at the end, you'll hear my voice at the end. I think I say, okay, kid, you got the part. Yeah, that's, that's right, it's on the tape. That's it. And so you knew both, both with Drew, you have the meeting, and with right away. Off, you're like, and also Robert McNaughton, I knew right away. The yeah. Robert was the older brother, Michael. I knew from right away. He was, he was fantastic. <laughs> Robert was really fantastic. Hi, Robert. Uh, Mike is the uh, unsung hero of that family. Um, that's right. So, oh, you know about that, huh? Yeah, so, uh, I wasn't going to mention Deborah Winger, but uh, so in the rough cut, then, Deborah Winger? Well, what happened was I needed a temp voice for E.T. before it Ben Burt brilliantly found, and if you were up here to tell the whole story of this older woman he found when he was buying like aspirin at a drugstore, and he listened to her voice, and he said, there's the voice of E.T. She was like a, she smoked four packs of cigarettes a day, and she had a cigarette voice, and it was not exactly an ad for the American Tobacco Company. <laughs> But Ben found her, but before that, and, and Deborah and I were very close friends, and she was actually in the Halloween sequence. She's wearing a doggy mask, and she has a stethoscope around her neck, and she's limping, so when you watch the movie, you'll, you'll spot her through E.T.'s eye holes going past camera. And I asked Deborah just to do every single line of E.T.'s. So we just went into the makeup and hair trailer, and nobody else was in there, I had a Nagra turned it on and she just went through all the dialogue. And so the first, what, 50 people that saw my movie heard, De heard Deborah Winger as E.T. <laughs> so this, uh, you, you, it's 1982, so by now you're a, you're a grown man, you're in the mid-30s, mid right, at, at this point. But you were a, a single guy, right? You were, um, and, and you were, I self-described, a uh, workaholic, right? I mean, you, what you did is you made movies and that's what fueled you, that's where you felt best. Right? Don't, you, don't all of us do that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then you, you, had you ever thought about having children? No. <laughs> I never thought about having kids because it, it, the, the, there was not an, a, any kind of an equation that made sense to me because I was going from movie to movie to movie, from script to script to script, and I, I just, it never occurred to me until halfway through ET. And uh, what do you mean? Well, I just, I just, it, I was a parent on that film. I was, I was literally feeling like I was very protective of Henry and Mike and and and, and uh, you know uh, my whole cast, and especially Drew, who was only six years old. And I started thinking, well, maybe this could be my real life someday. It was the first time it ever occurred to me that maybe I, I could be a dad. But maybe, in a way, a director is a dad or or a mom. And, uh, and it started to really gnaw away at me. So when I left those kids, when we all went our separate ways and met again when we did the press for the film, uh, although Drew stayed in my life for years and years and years, and, and uh, I'm, I really felt that that would be my next big production. Did you, uh, did you have children? Do you have any children, Stephen? <laughs> I have seven kids and six grandkids. So E.T. works work for me very well. And thank God for Kate Pastor. I'll thank you, my, my wife. Yeah. Uh, uh, why did you retire after ET? You should have made another film. <laughs> uh, 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 look, there's is uh, I, I don't know whether I speak for everyone here, but I think I do. I know that this is a crowd of people that does not uh, like uh, remakes in general. You know, we're very protective. Um, but man, if those of you who haven't seen the uh, Steven Spielberg version of uh, West Side Story, uh, yeah! Uh, uh, the great news is, uh, I just learned uh, how old your parents were when they passed, and then uh, it suggests that there are a lot of years left, and I suspect a lot of films left, and uh, uh, we're all grateful for that. So, yeah, thank you. Just a taste of the audio we captured at this year's TCM Classic Film Festival. We'll be dropping more over on our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, which includes our recordings of the panel discussions with Piper Laurie, Disney animator Floyd Norman, and Margaret O'Brien. We also have the intros from Diane Baker during The Group, and Patricia Ward-Kelly when she introduced It's Always Fair Weather, coming soon as well. 
You can see our videos of the event, including red carpet coverage and intros, at our Tickwish Biz YouTube channel, as well as on TikTok and Instagram if you search for Tickwish Biz. And if you haven't subscribed to us, we're on all podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify, where your reviews help us a ton. We'll be back with a new episode in two weeks. Until then.